on uh, firstly welcome to everybody that joined us this morning and then uh, secondly uh, big welcome to Andre um, I, you know I was thinking this morning way back most probably it was uh, middle 90s you know you presented at a few of our conferences and already you at that time had the foresight to talk about not products and stuff that at that stage you were still uh, at old mutual not about products and stuff you, you came and told us about values and understanding the values of our clients and why that is important and then i i think the, the big thing andre is you took that forward and made it part part of becoming your own boss and mm. uh exploring your passion uh, you know and bringing it that you know, if I read this latest book of you, Anarlatenskap, you know, where you write about family businesses and the importance of values as part of that. And, you know, if I, I now re read the book very much from a, from a coaching perspective, you, you know, there's so many examples where you, you, in the real stories as well as the fictional stories where you had to, and you can call it whatever, but that is things that happens every day in our our practices as financial advisors where you actually have to coach and be a guide for your clients and be a thinking partner for, for your clients. So welcome. And uh, the floor is open to you, Andre. And, uh, you know, this, uh, some of the people you'll most probably um, recognize and uh, um, from, from somewhere in the industry. And um, yeah, so you Welcome to say, share whatever you've got on the heart to share with us this morning, Andre. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Hendrik. You guys can hear me clearly. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe just a bit of background as to why I focus on family-owned businesses specifically. Um, as, as Hendrik has mentioned, I was Old Mutual's National Marketing Manager that looked after the business market for many years. And I was sent to a conference in Puerto Rico in the Caribbean islands where 60 countries got together to speak about business development. And in this conference, they kept on focusing on family-owned businesses. And I asked the question, why do you keep on talking about family-owned businesses? And I will never forget the American professor when he turned around and looked at me as though I'm from a strange planet and asked me, but don't you know that most businesses in the world are family-owned? I said, no, I have no clue. And he started with his statistics. He, he said 78% of the wealth in the USA belongs to family-owned businesses. 75% of registered businesses in the UK are family-owned. And so he carried on. When I came back to South Africa, you must remember my background. I'm a marketing strategist. So if this is the same thing in South Africa, we need to know it. Because I could see a very quick link between what we did in our industry in financial services and what but they were hampering about, you know, the problem with succession planning. And they mentioned that only 30% of family-owned businesses move successful from the first to the second generation, and less than 4% reach the fourth generation. And most of them don't bypass the third generation. There's a third generation problem. So we couldn't find those statistics in South Africa, and it cost it all mutual half a million rand in those days. I'm talking about more than two decades ago. Just to answer the question, because we had to do primary research, which we did in those days through a, a guy called Professor Gideon Maas, who was stationed at Nelson Mandela University. And then we've learned that 80% of registered businesses in South Africa are family-owned. In the farmer's market, commercial farmers, 96% are family-owned. As a matter of fact, there's 570 million commercial farmers in the world, of which 500 million are family family farmers. So that is why the United Nations declared the next decade the decade of family farmers is because actually family farmers that feeds the world. The moment I knew that, I said to Old Mutual, we better, you know, create a center of competence for family businesses if this is the case. And then they, they bought into the principle and they started sending me all over the world to learn about the challenges and the best practices to deal with those challenges. So we've created quite a center of competence in those days for family-owned businesses. And then I saw in every country that I went to, there's some kind of body, whether association or network or institute, but there is a body that represents the, you know, the interest of family businesses. 
I then sold the idea to Old Mutual in those days, and that is where Fabasa, the Family Business Association of South Africa, comes from. Mutual was the founding sponsor of that. And 13 years ago, I left at the age of 50, and as financial planners, you would know that's a very dangerous thing to do. My pension is not what it's supposed to be. How can you walk out at 50? It's a bad idea. And I tell you guys, I did not touch ground over the last 13 years. There's too much work, and I've dealt, I've by now consulted over 400 family owned businesses in South Africa. I've even consulted in Namibia, Botswana, and England, and I'm busy with family businesses in, in New York now. Uh, interesting enough, the family business in New York is a South African who immigrated there, but I still work with South Africans to assist, to assist them with their problems. And then the challenges of fam family owned businesses are very clear. <laughs> And just as a matter of interest, most of my business actually comes from financial advisors and auditors and attorneys, especially when there's conflict in the family business. They call me in to go and deal with that. So I do a lot of mediation as well, you know, to fix this problem. Now, you might ask, you might ask let me tell you about this book, Nile Art and Scope, Legacy. You know, I do a lot of workshops and, and over the over the COVID period, I did a lot of webinars. You know, interesting enough that COVID was very good for my business. A lot of people who kept on procrastinating suddenly changed during COVID. And my business literally, well, I do six times more business today than I did before COVID. People now actually want their thing, you know, to make sure this stuff is in place. Now, then I, I was thinking of a way to convey best practices to people in a manner that, that's easy for them. So I, I wrote a novel. A novel out in Scope, or Legacy in English, is a novel. It's an Afrikaans novel that used, as Hendrik has mentioned, real characters, real family businesses with their real names, like Fanny Van Amara from Boerplaas uh, in the Kohl-Bockerfeld, the oldest family business in South Africa. They were founded in 1743. Uh, Valin now from Womanshoek in the Eastern Free State, uh, the, the German Tilly family in, in Lüneburg, they're close to Paul Petersburg. Uh, my own brother, Leon Diedrichs, our family business is in Somerset West here in Cape Town. And so you can carry on. And real things that happened with them. And then I had these fictional characters as well, because there's certain things that happen in family business. That is, Hendrik, I don't know whether you know, some of, the, some of those fictional characters and stories are actually true. Uh, I thought, just changed, I th uh, yeah, I thought that's actually true stories. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I've just changed the names and the places where they come from. But that is just to illustrate what happens in family businesses. What I mainly do is uh, I create a family business constitu constitution, and I'll explain that now. And then I focus on succession planning. And in succession planning, I very, work very closely with their financial advisor. Sometimes in, in one meeting, uh, we would have the auditor, the financial advisor, and the attorney present in these sessions. Uh, just to give you an idea of all the aspects that we touch on, I'll get in a bit more detail about that now. The fictional stories, just for your, your, your well, it is interesting Um the character I'm using is, is a cousin of Fani uh, van der Merwe, Willem van der Merwe. He's, he's living in, in Fitzburg and he's farming. But 20 years ago, well, more than 20 years ago, he had a fallout with his son because he brought this English or Scottish lady called Alison McKenzie to the farm and she was a Roman Catholic. So he totally, the father couldn't deal with that at all because he's a typical Afrikaner. You don't bring English, you don't marry with the English people. They killed our forefathers, and now she's a Roman Catholic as well. <laughs> now, that has led to a huge outfall, but it became a very sad story because the son actually left. And this is now more than 20 years ago that the son and the father has never had any contact. He didn't even speak to his mother. Uh, and in the meantime, he immigrated with Alison to, to uh, Bankshire in, in, in you know, Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where he now founds with his, his father-in-law, Craig McKenzie. Now his father, yeah, the one who started this, this nonsense, uh, Willem, Willem in South Africa, is dying of cancer. You know, But the, the guilt about what happened between him and his son is actually worse than the cancer inside him. And he's got only one wish, 
and that is to see his son again uh, once before he dies. And that is when Fani van Amava got a call, and that is when Fani called me, and that is when I called my contact, Richard Hollyborn in England, and then we found the family, and then we had to go there to reconcile this. It's an extremely emotional thing, you can imagine. Right. But that is the one story. The other story is a typical thing that happens. He's a guy called Dries Birgis here from Pumalanga uh, in Middleburg. He's a farmer. He's very conservative. He serves on the church council. He's married to Lisa, and I've got two sons. But more than 25 years ago, long before he had a relationship with his wife, he was a student at Potts University, and they went to the Oktoberfest in München. It was a student here. <clears throat> and that evening, he ended up in bed with a girl, a lady called Marie, a German lady. And you can imagine what happened there. That Bacchus had an influence. The next day, he flew back to South Africa. He felt so guilty about this. He didn't even want to stay there any longer. He just wanted to get this out of his mind. But as the story happens, 25 years later, a girl called Brigitte walks into his office in, in Middleburg, his daughter, which he didn't know about. You can imagine all the drama that would follow there. So those are the typical things that would happen in a family-owned business. You might ask the question, what I teach family businesses more than anything else is what does legacy mean? You see, legacy is not just about what you leave for your children. It's actually about what you leave in your children. Can you understand that expression? Remember what Hendrik has said about values. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. I've published a number of books in, in what we call the Nights of Series, Business, Jungle and Field Wisdom and Leadership, Values, uh, Wisdom from the Plant Kingdom. I use analogies from Nights to teach people. I happened to do all these things for seven years in a row in Kaknet on, on Beitsaka, where all of this we actually did. Uh, in the field, can't help him in those days. So uh, there's one book, Leadership Values. The point of the part today is the average lifespan of businesses in the world is 25 years. Why then do you find businesses that survive for more than centuries and even more than a thousand years? You know, the oldest business that I worked with was called Congo Gumi. In Japan, it's the oldest in the world. They were founded in 578 after Christ. And this family is in their 51st generation. Can you imagine that? So I wanted to know how did they survive. So I went to the oldest businesses in the world and, of, of course, to Boerplatz, which is the oldest business in South Africa. And I asked the question, how did you survive for so long? And the answer was simple. It's about values that they imprint in their children from generation to generation as to the way they do things. And if you don't adhere to those values, there are serious consequences. Can you hear what they're doing? So it's a totally value-driven thing, and that's why they've been around for so many centuries. I then wrote this book because I asked him, what are these values you're referring to? And it's not, it's not difficult things. It's things like consistency, fairness, integrity, stewardship, uh, servant leadership is something that came strong, uh, very strong from these family businesses. Do you see there's nothing, a wisdom, a passion, those kind of things. Those are the typical values that, that drives them. I then link that to plants and trees. You might find that very interesting, but you can actually do it. Once you understand plants or essential oils in plants, and you know there's certain properties in plants, it becomes easy to link it to a specific value. Just to give you an example of what I did, integrity, for instance, is linked to jasmine. Now, yeah, if what time of the day does jasmine smell on its best? Come on, somebody tell me. Cindy, I can't get your, your mic is off. <coughs> uh, mic is Talking to uh, myself. Um, yes. Yeah, usually I think in the early morning or the in the late, you know, or going into evening. Yeah, people think it's early morning, know. but it's actually in the, uh, in the evening after the sun has set. Then the smell is on its strongest as well, and that's what I teach them. That is what integrity is about, is how do you smell in the dark, because that's where you really are. Uh, and then a very important value that came through from family businesses is what we call stewardship. That is probably the most important value for family businesses. 
You must remember the essence of a family business is there's somebody that created something. Now the next generation is coming in. They need to take care, safeguard what was built up, you know, from the generations before them and safeguard it for their children that will follow. So this is the essence of family businesses. So the business does not belong to you. You are merely the steward of the responsibility in your generation to keep it going for those that will follow you. Now, nobody has, has, has described this better than the oldest family business in South Africa, Boerplas. I ask her, they are in the 11th generation now. They were founded in 1743. I asked Mum Carlo in those days, how did you survive for so long? And he taught me, they were taught from generation to generation that this farm does not belong to this generation. We merely borrow it from the children. Do you hear those words? Not we inherit it from our fathers, we borrow it from our children. And that is the essence of what the family, family businesses need to understand. Now, the two processes that I look at is a family business constitution. All you need to get in your in your mind is, is, is a weighing scale. And, you know, you know, one is family and the other one is business. If, if those two baskets are uneven, you've got problems. You get people that focus so strongly on the financial success of the family business that they don't care about the relationships and then the children disappear anyway. They don't want to stay there anyway. Gone is the family business. Or you get family businesses that care so much about this, you know, the happiness of the children that the business is going down the drain. Can you see? Everything is about balance. And that is what we do in a family business constitution. We create balance between the interests of the family and the interests of the business. It will always start with what is the vision. They need to agree on the vision for the future. Then we do the values exercise. They need to agree on the core values. And then we do things like we define family because it becomes important for uh, you know ownership. Then we go through a whole. We create a whole uh, employee policy. Uh, the way they remunerate, may remunerate themselves, everything is done in the family business constitution. When that is, that is done, there are very strict rules as to how to manage this business. And remember, this constitution will impact on all future generations. We also make rules for succession in, in the constitution. Let me give you a piece of, of wisdom. <clears throat> I had a TV interview with Raymond Ackerman from Pick and Pay. My question to him is, why didn't any of his children become the CEO of Pick and Pay? And listen to this wisdom. He said to me, the business is there to create welfare, you know, to create wealth for the family. Whoever the best person is to run that will do it because that is in the interest of the family. Do you hear that piece of wisdom? So it's not always one of your children as the best person to run the business. It doesn't change anything. It's still a family-owned business. And secondly, he taught me that a successor must uh, be willing and able. You know, it, does, it, it doesn't help if you're willing but able or able but not willing. None of his children were willing to take over as a CEO of Pick and Pay. Uh, Gareth is now the chairperson of the board. I don't know whether you're aware of that. So that has changed over the years. But then, so the rules for succession is, there would, for instance, be a rule if there's no natural succession from the family who's able and willing to take over, then the family business may appoint somebody from the outside who's competent to run the business on behalf of the family. So those are the typical things that you would find in there. Uh, when I work with farmers, for instance, I teach them the international rules. Now, you might not know us, but there's an international rule for farmers, what was called data, 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 third, third, third. Farmers you, you may not spend more than one-third of their annual expenses on salary, salary and salary-related expenses, what we call cost to company. That includes all the free cell phones, you know, and all the free diesel and all that stuff. So I teach my clients and I lead them freely, no more than a third of your budget may be spent on that. Now we have rules for success, and then we do the success, and this is getting very close to your game now. The very first question in the succession plan would be, do you want to keep it in the family? So remember, there's a decision tree that I work with. If they say we want to keep it in the family, then I'll explain that process to you now. 
If they say, no, we don't want to do it, then we look at management buyout. If we don't do management buyout, we look at so, you know, selling it in the market. And I take clients just through all those processes, but mainly focus on keeping it in the family. But I've done a number of businesses where they could not keep it in the family, and I had to take them through the process as to what they need to do. Keeping it in the family, I said, okay, let's identify your successor. And a lot of times there's not only one success, eh? there's more than one child that, that might be involved. And then I would ask him, uh, did I make sure they prepare their successes properly? What kind of training do I need? What is the gaps? What needs to be done? Can you see what I do here? I go much further than the financial side of things. Then I would ask them, okay, now here's the question. I, The success and plan must address every possible life event. And I've made mistakes here in the beginning, eh? Okay, the first question would be what happens if something happens to the father or the mother today? I want a plan in place. Then I say, then I ask this important question, which I didn't do years ago until it happened to me. I've just done a succession plan for a business in Pretoria, and a week later the son died, the successor. So now in a succession plan, I want to know immediately what happens if something happens to the successor. I want an answer now already. You can understand what's going on here. Right, then we go through those processes and where most of the problems with family businesses come is the moment I get to their structure. The moment I check check whether their structures are tax-friendly or not is where the problems start. And a lot of times there I need to the attorney or the audit or the financial advisor to come and sort out things. So what I do is when I pick up problems, I would contact that financial advisor and say, this is a problem, you need to address this, you need to fix this, and this is what you need to do. Can you understand what I'm saying? You will not believe I still have farms today, like a guy in Promsburg, who's got 14 farms and still farms as a sole proprietor. I don't have to explain to you what drama that is in terms of estate duty and everything that's going to happen there, but you still find it today. What we mostly do, especially in the farming community, is we have... We create trust. There's a trust and there's what we call operational company. And we most most of the times, the trust will be the only shareholder of the operational company. That's the way we keep it out of the estate and we have, don't have to transfer it from generation to generation. This game you guys should understand. So we make sure it's tax friendly. If not, we have to fix it. And sometimes it's quite difficult. You know, you can't just create a trust. You know about the nation's tax. You know about all that stuff. So, but when, when I when I get to that point, I very can very easily see because I comes from the in- industry. I want you to make understand very clearly. I'm an accredited family business consultant. There's only a few of us in this country, and I don't know about any other accredited family business consultant who's, who does this full full time. The others are all professors, Professor Elmery and Professor Peter and Professor Dem. Then they do it in between when they can. I'm not a certified financial planner. I'm an accredited family business consult, consult, consultant. So I don't work with finances the moment, I'm, but but because I come from, the, come from the industry, I can immediately see if there's a problem. So it becomes easy for me to tell a financial advisor who's certified to do this, you need to go and sort this out, and this is the problem. You understand all of these, hey? Then I would ask them questions, do you have a wall? Is that well in line with what we decide in this, this you know, in this uh, succession plan? If there's a trust, I make sure there's an independent trustee, you know, all that stuff. And if there's problems there, we fix that as well. And then I move forward and say, okay, now dad is dying today. What's going to happen to mom? And if there's still minor children, and now I'm straight into your game. Can you hear what I'm saying? And okay, is there provision for mom? Is there provision for the, minor, you know, the dependent children or not? If there's a problem there, who do you think we call? I call the financial advisor. And let me tell you now, I'm 63 years old. I don't take nonsense from clients anymore, okay? I don't ask. I tell and we pick up the phone and we call. It needs to be sorted. You understand? It stays right in the document until this is sorted. Sometimes they don't have a financial advisor, and then I would call people in that area. I think if I don't know people, I would call people who know people to find out who's the most suitable person, you know, to look after those clients. Because I don't get involved on that level. All right. And then I also, the last question in the succession plan would be, is can they retire independently from this business? 
Now, let me tell you, 90% of family-owned businesses, the father cannot retire independently from the business. He keeps on being dependent. And you, know, you need to do those calculations, and the children need to understand what this means, because there's a responsibility. <clears throat> Some strict rule from me as well is if the father and the mother is trustees of the business, they will remain trustees un until their death. You don't give your estate over before you're not there. I've seen too many problems with that. I worked with a family business. The father and the mother retired in George, and they gave the farm over to the children. And four years later, the farm was gone, and they're in their 70s, and they have no other provision. Can you understand what I'm saying? You don't give over your estate before you're dead, and that's it. Yo, Hendrik, and I think I've spoken enough now. Uh, guys should understand who I am and what I do now. Is there any questions? Yeah, I think everybody can, if you want to, you can put on your cameras and, you know, ask Andre questions and have a conversation, you know, so, yeah. Are you guys working with family businesses? Uh, <coughs> Cindy, you're yeah, saying... No, I am speaking, Andre. Morning, everyone. Hi, Robert. Is it what speaking? Is what speaking? Yeah, it's funny. Hello, Munir. Um, yeah, that was that was uh, that was a mouthful. But gee whiz, what valuable information you've actually given me there! You know, it was. I've, I've got a couple of family businesses that I deal with, and also trying to figure out how that 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 legacy is actually going to play out. And and one thing that you did mention there was was the important of, the importance of having the right person in place is actually going to take over. Yes, you know, yeah. we're now where where the father is not really stuck in the business, but he enjoys doing it. It's his hobby. Um, having the business and the business runs well, but his son, although he wants to be part of it, is really there. And I say this loosely as more of like a, I, I, I don't know, look, there's other words that I use, but he's kind of just, he's just there. He's just filling a place and it doesn't seem like he's really got a purpose in that business. And, you know, I've tried to have that conversation with them a lot of the time to say to the, the owner of the business, where, who's going to take over if your son's not going to do it? Because then you may as well close the doors now, yeah. sell your business, and go and, and sell up another one. Warwick, let me give you a tip there. What we do, there's, there's actually practices. Uh, we work only with best practices. So, I mean, I've been in Madeira, Madeira a few years ago to go and learn from the Blandy family there as well. But what we do is a lot of farmers are, uh, fathers are reluctant to let go, especially if it's the first generation. They better say, Baba, you don't want to let go of this baby. Looking, but I have a process of leading them out of that to make it much on, easier. This trans, this, the, the, this, can you guys can hear me, eh? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I, I think, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, somebody's talking, so I'm not sure if somebody... But, uh, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, I to, uh, wanted to answer this question of yours. One of the things we also do in the Constitution is I make a rule about retirement age. Can you hear what we're doing? And a lot of times when I work with these families, the father is already older than the retirement age that we're making in this Constitution. You understand? But then I quickly convinced him and said, this is for future generations. And my reason for that is simple. We cannot do proper succession planning if we don't know what time you're going to retire because you need to know exactly when your successor must be right and in place and competence to take over. Otherwise, it's become a never-ending thing. You understand what I'm saying? And then what, what we do then, because I, they mostly have, have companies, what we do is we change the roles at that retirement age. The father then becomes the chairperson of the board. Can you hear what I'm saying? Maar wat is noem nie uitvoerende voorzitter? A non-executive chairperson because it's important that he must be around when the children take over so that we can test their skills in you know in decision making while the father is still around but they must take over the executive responsibilities and it, it seems that family businesses find it much easier to do it in this manner because the father is now not pushed out of his own business he's chairperson of the board but now we can expose the children to decision making and the stuff that's going on in the business and we found that that is the, by far the easiest and best practice to do this. So I'm just planting that seed for you so that you 
we actually do de deal with those kind of problems. Anything else? Can I ask you uh, if um, your your clients do they come to you? Uh, they refer to you. Um, how how do you? Because in, in my uh, experience, um, especially on the farming community, uh, families are very uh, reluctant to address uh, <laughs> the obvious problems uh, that is on on the table, and a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of conflict, a lot of ego, a lot of power issues play out. Um, and um, uh, I would be interested to know, you know, how how do these families land up uh, in your office? Okay, Mariette, first of all, you can never do what I do what I do when you're young. You can forget it. They will never listen to you. I was 50 when I started it, and I don't actually think anybody younger than that should even con consider doing this because the parents won't listen to you. And secondly, you need to be in very strong co connection with younger people because, remember, you need to please two generations here. You need to have the wisdom to deal with the parents, and you need to be open enough for the children to feel that they can they can be part of this process. You hear that? That's the first thing I want to say to you. I hear, now, but what I, I also want there? to ask you is, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, so uh, where does women uh, come into play here? <laughs> there is no reason why women can... Uh, uh, let, uh, let me let me pinpoint women in the whole process. One of the things we do, uh, I don't know if he was involved, I said you need to create a fair, uh, you know, a sound balance between the interests of the family and the of the business okay let me explain to you how we do that because that's where the mother is coming in to ensure that that we safeguard the business is i lead my family business is always to you know is recommended in, in in the new regulations of the company's act of act of april 2011 i kind of force them to appoint at least one non-family member non-shareholder on the board of directors but that person must be a wise business person and they check their business decisions. Can you see what we do? So we appoint, if you go and read the, regular, the new regulations of the, of, of the Companies Act of 2011, you'll see it coming strong very surely there. You should be at least one person on your board of directors that is not a, that is, that, that is not a shareholder. So that is how we look after the business side. And then what we call what, we, we, we call what is called a family, a family forum, a family forum. <clears throat> The task of the family forum only to manage relationships. Can you hear what I'm saying? Only relationships. Not get involved in the business. And those relationships must is, is further than just the immediate family. It's with all this, you know, the in-laws, because that is normally where this, the problems come from in family businesses if you have conflict. Is the moment the, the children marry, then their spouse starts, most of the time, starts the problem in the family business. Okay, that's 90% of the time. So what we create, do there is we create a family forum that actively manages the relationships and any conflict within that family business. And there the mother is always, by, by far, not always, but more than 99% of the time the mother would take over that role. Women simply do this better than men. It's just a fact of life. Uh, we have a we have a title for mothers in a family business. We call him the CEOs. Do you know what that means? Hendrik, weet you what it means? Yeah. It means chief emotional officer. <laughs> okay, that is our title because that is the role that happens to mothers when there's conflict. Is normally the mother that steps in between the father and the children, and the mother that steps in between the children and the siblings if there's sibling rivalry and things like that. That's are not very good with that. <laughs> Now, Maria, I'm not done with you. I want to teach you what happens with businesses. Remember, I have a lot of family businesses. Some of them are women that farms very successfully. But a wonderful story I want to tell you is this. Have you ever heard about Ina Lessing, Lessing Confeita? Have you heard about that? Now, their story is uh, they farm in, 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 in uh, uh, Nelstrom. I don't know what I call Nelstrom now. Morning or something. I'm not sure. About those names. Morimole. Is it Morimole? Now, there's no Donnie in our lesson that I speak about. Now, he found with, with apricots and she started making this apricot jam. And uh, But she just do, do it in a different manner. So everybody that tasted it said, where can I find this apricot jam? Now, to make a long story short, that, that woman, the mother, 
The father now worked for the mother because at this stage, in unlacing, Confiter becomes such a huge business that she must own netto bestelling on order every year is 800, 800 tons of 800 tons, where you am I? 800 tons of jam just on order per year. It became a massive business. So do you still want to ask me about questions about women in the business and what happens? Yeah, is I've seen a lot of success stories. And I felt, I, I see in Marietta I means that sometimes a lot more wisdom from the mothers than the fathers in the business. Make no mistake. You know, you, you can always ask you what is what is the difference between uh, knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and if you look at the dictionary, it would be that uh, wisdom is a combination of knowledge and experience, right? Now, mothers has got more experience with dealing with emotions than fathers. This is what life has taught me, you know, all the years that I've been involved with this business. I want to ask you guys a funny thing. Do you know what is the core value of the oldest business in the world? Kongo Gumi, the Japanese company. It's vision. Have you ever thought about vision as a value? To me, values are integrity and honesty and things like that. You understand what I'm saying? So I asked him, why vision? And they say to me, have you heard about this Japanese principle they call the Kaizen principle? Have you guys heard about that? Yeah. You know what it means? It means continual renewal. Now you understand why they're around the 1,500 years later, because their core value is continual renewal. And then, But Mariette, uh, Mariette, can you still hear me? Uh, I sometimes I, I can see your mic. Okay, your mic is on now. I sometimes I sometimes it depends on 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 what kind of conflict we deal with. Sometimes I call in Professor Elmery Fenter from from uh, you know Nelson Mandela University if I think a woman is going to deal better with the conflict than a man would, and I know where, then I would call her in to go and deal with that. And and the result the end result is always better. Yeah, I'm very good with. Um, mediation but i can get very impatient as well all right because i know right from wrong you understand what i'm saying but old mediators has taught me extremely important lesson when you go into mediation the first thing you need to determine is if this is dead or just ill can you hear what i'm saying that's the first thing a mediator would do uh, sometimes relationships are is, is dead there's nothing you're going to change in that relationship Especially if they are the beginsels bots, bots. You understand that thing? If there's a war between principles, you're not going to change them. Then it's better for them to split and go and do their own things. If it's ill, we have to figure out how ill and what is the treatment, and that's what we do. But sometimes I, I do pull in Professor Elmery because I just know it's going to work better than me dealing with it. Uh, it's the way it is. Um, and, and you know, and the funny part is you would think if there's a lot of women in control that I was calling a woman, that's the last thing you need to do. A man works much better with a bunch of women where there's conflict than women would work with that woman. And the other, and, and the vice versa, so there's a lot of men where men have got problems where I had better results bringing in a woman to deal with that than a man would do. So it depends. I've been around with these things for so many years. I just know. When, when I shouldn't do this and when I should pull, you just know it. You just feel it. You just know it. Yeah. I think the, 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 the secret of uh, Nenika is of, of life is, you know, to have the right combination and to know when you must step back and when you need to pull yes. in your brain trust. Yes. And I think, you know, in business that is so. You know, you have to have people around you that you can trust. Uh, with your clients, uh, you know, to to take over when you see that uh, you you yes. you had a dead block, you know, a dead end. Ma Marie, to answer your first question, because I haven't asked you a question, you asked me how do I get these clients. We haven't even answered that. You must remember, I had a bit of an advantage in my old mutual days. I was a lot in the media because I published myself. It has kept me in the media. You know, you remember I said I was seven years on TV. I was in, in, in the Burger and the Volksblatt and, 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 and those new papers every Saturday for seven years in a row. So people actually knew me by the time that, that I walked out. It makes a huge difference, you know. It made it easier for me to do. 
I just had to figure out a way to keep myself in, in, in the media, and I'm still in the media. I do more than 200 radio talks per annum. Uh, still do it. I've, I've published more than 2,500 articles. Okay, you say, you hear what I'm saying? It's a combination of the fact that I, I'm, I'm a writer. So people read my articles. Remember what I do the moment you read my article, you can see my knowledge. You can see my competence. Can you see? And that's what Hendrik said. And whenever I address audiences, I never talk about products. I convey my wisdom because that is what people buy. Okay? They need to know that you know. And that is the secret of these things. And then, Marie, by now, of course, I'm happy that uh, I've done so well in this market. By, by now, my, my clients are keeping me in this market. Um, I rarely ever have to find new clients. They call me every day from all over. Uh, it's a simple refer referral game in, 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 in the States of my life. You know, Marie, the worst thing is now that I feel I'm getting older and my energy is, energy is going. I've got more and more business. I sometimes just wish life, life wants to work, work around the other way. You understand what I'm saying? But it's, when, it's, it's after all these years of a lot of effort that you now reap, reap from that, and then I can feel it. I mean, I, I, the, just the last two weeks, I had to be in, in Vormeranstadt. I don't even like driving from Gauteng to Vormeranstadt, going through the traffic. A week later, this week, yesterday, I came back again. I had to be in Paris, and, 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 and all. we've been on buses with, with farms. And that's the other thing that I do my business through. Companies call me in who deals with family businesses, okay? Where it's like us in Telegram, for instance, and a lot of banks and, and life insurers would pay me to address their clients. So I do a lot of, uh, I, I don't only consult, I'm a public speaker as well, and I charge good fees. For that as well. So <clears throat> I if you've been in the game as long as I have, you know, you get a lot of these companies and said, but you they don't want to pay you to speak because they say because you can then consult these people afterwards. And then I would tell them speaking, public speaking is is one of the cash streams in my business. If you don't pay me, go away. So I got away with that for all these years. So clients actually fund my marketing cost as well. Uh, I, hear, I hope you hear what I'm saying because they're paying me to speak to their clients and their clients can see what I know because that's what you need to convey is the wisdom that you have. Those are the kind of things. But at this stage in my life, uh, the market knows me well enough. But for you to get access to that market, you need to get involved with with uh, farming, uh, farming societies. Uh, you need to be selective, but uh, i got a lot of business through business chambers. I've always been members of business chambers and those kind of things. You need to be in a network where you can get to people. But you, you must select your network in a manner that you want to get to the client that you want to get to. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. And you need to position yourself. Is I think why my business is successful is the old marketing edits I want to teach you. And you all should listen to this. If you want to broaden your appeal, you need to narrow your focus. I'm going to repeat that, Hendrik. Mm. If you want to broaden your appeal, you need to narrow your focus. Why am I successful is there are thousands of business consultants, but very few family business consultants. And the dynamics in the family business is totally different from a non-family business. So I selected an area where I could become the master. Can you hear what I'm saying? And everybody knows that I know exactly what's going on in family businesses. So I'm not trying to be everything for everybody. I specialize, and that to me is a secret. If you want to broaden your appeal, you need to narrow your focus. Dion, I think I you wanted to say something, and then I think you had to grab a call or something. <laughs> so Andre, what is your succession plan? Uh, uh, my succession plan? You know the fact about it, mechanics cars never working, eh? <laughs> I've got to say, <clears throat> Dion, I'm actually, well, I'm actually busy with that for the last two years. Simply trying to identify, because you can imagine the character that do what I do. You need to be a psychologist. You need to be a legal person. You need to be a financial advisor. You need to be everything. Mm. And you need to be old enough to be able to do this. And you mm. need the right personality as well. 
Okay, mm-hmm. you need patience. I mean, I sit through conflict sometimes that you get Trap my hand, you only tafel fast net om stil te blij, want ek wil nou hier inklim, jy verstaan, and then you need to learn to shut up. You need to be an ex- excellent listener, and there's a reason why you have one mouth and two ears, eh? why you made that, made that way. But to learn that in life is extremely difficult. So you need to be all of those things to be able to take over. But Dion, I've got a, I've got a, a, a real challenge here. Mm. Because I don't only want one person, I need a I need a few persons spread out through the country that can keep on with the work that I'm doing whilst I'm here to actually teach them to properly do this job. Mm. But to find the right people, I had names and I've t- and I take, took some of them with me uh, took, when I consult. I've taken them there with me to sit through me and then I almost immediately realized this person is not going to work in, in this job. Mm. Okay. Like the one I took in Cape Town the other way. He just can't keep his mouth. He just wants to talk all the time. You don't talk when you consult. You listen. You, you understand what I'm saying? So I have a problem. Then the other guy I took there, I could just see these insight in financial things are just not there. There's no natural understanding of things. Then you you must steer away. So I've been through about 10 guys, Dion, to answer your question. There are one or two that I would potentially carry on with, but there are huge areas where I have a huge challenge. And let me tell you, a very important area is, is uh, Hendrik, where you come from. I mean, the free state is one big family business. All right. The free state as a family business. Right? Mm-hmm. So there's more farmers in the free state than any other province. Are you aware of that? It's one big family business. <laughs> And my clients, you know, I live in Cape Town in the Western Cape. More than 50% of my clients comes from the Free State. West and East Free State. And a lot of them from KwaZulu-Natal and a lot of them from Mpumalanga. And less than 10% of my clients is from the Western Cape. Can you imagine that? You do more business outside your area than in your area. But John, that you hear my question, you can see there's a burning, there's a brandende ding on my name. You can, you can pick it up. Can, can Something we need to address. Hendrik, I, I hope through this forum of your, it will help me find the right people as well. Where? Hendrik, yeah. yes. can you hear my Yes. Yes, Dion. Why, why don't you put together a course that people actually pay for, advisors pay for? And 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 you teach them what you know. And by engaging with them, with learning them through the course, and, it, and it's not for free, you pay you get paid for your time. You can identify certain p- people that actually might fit the what, what how can I put it? That that are the right fit for, for what you are doing. Yeah, I would have to do that on my own because remember that course already exists because part of what you need to do to get accredited is you go through Nelson Mandela University is doing accreditation in South Africa. There's international bodies called FFI, Family Firm Institute, and then your institution becomes a member of an international body. And they actually are people that are accredited, but that is outsourced to the different countries as well. In South Africa, it's mm-hmm. Professor Elmerie Fenton from Nelson Mandela University. She takes you through that course. I've been through that course as well. Uh, and then you, there's certain exams you have to complete before you become a credit. So if I want to select really somebody to take over from me, I'm going to have to do my own course because I can't see from the people that sees. Some of them I can see is just going through the course because the employer thinks it's a good idea. To go through this course, but yeah. I never really end up and st- understand this game. Yeah, so I, you, I'm, you're I'm probably lucky. very, yeah, you're probably very close to the truth, Dion. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm I have to, I, I have to create a course in a manner where I can test who this person actually is. Hmm. She's not doing that. So yes, uh, right, Dion, what you say. Well, yeah, so, so I'm not referring to a formal course. That it, it would be a waste. All the knowledge that you've gained over the years hmm. that 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 dies with you one day. If, if you can just create something, it doesn't have to be formal. You don't have to print booklets, accreditation, nothing. Just teach yeah. us what you know. Yeah. Get, I, get, get, put a, let, and you, don't even, you don't even have to have a formal something. Just put something together where 
He said, look, it's going to cost you for, for, for 10 sessions to sit with me. It's, it's more like a coffee date. You start sharing what you know. And why interacting with these advisors, you will figure out who are the guys that actually gets it and who doesn't. Uh, I don't want to create more work for you, but it, it would be amazing to learn from you. And, and do you know uh, what, what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I saw this good plant in my now work. Hendrik, you could probably help me with that, eh? Um, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, it's actually mm. core of what you do. Uh, I like Dion's suggestion. Mm. Dion, I'll discuss this with Hendrik and figure out what the best way is to do this because mm. I like the idea. Because if, if And you since you're the guy that you guy ever gave us the idea, we come to you first, what? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. So so the thing is, is if, if after the whole thing that we've spent with you, 10 sessions, whatever it is, if we then want to go further and get formally accredited, then we can do the other courses. But yeah, then I can do the accredit accreditation. For and me, it's the just to process. learn from you. That, that's the main thing. Yeah. Thanks, Dion. Uh, I like it because I've, I'm looking for a way to figure this out. But I like what you're saying because it actually will give me a chance. Hendrik, we can easily, very easily structure it in a manner that we can figure out exactly who this, this person is. No? Yeah. But can show me like this? Yeah. Okay. Cindy, why are you smiling? What's going on in your head? <laughs> no, sorry. I just um I work with my mom and she just walked in. So I've got to smile okay. and wave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you have to but smile. But I do I mom. do like what Dion said as well. It's amazing. I think it's yeah, a great idea. Where are you guys sitting? Are you in Joburg or where where are you guys from? I'm in Cape Town, southern suburbs. Are you yeah, with me in the Cape? Yeah. Uh, There's Dion. I live in the northern suburbs. You know, in Cape Town, all your English lives live south and we live north. You know that. <laughs> yeah. huh? They, they yeah. say we are living behind the Boerewors container in Cape Town. That's where my mom's just come from. <laughs> okay. Sharon, from where are you? Um, I'm, I'm also in Cape Town, but I'm further, further north. So I'm sitting in Somerset West. <laughs> so oh, I don't know what that's my, for. That's where my brother lives. Okay, so is no, that I'm English often. speaking? Okay, okay. There's a lot <laughs> no. of Catalans. Do you know you? Do you know from no, where are you? In Belleville, fresh water from. Hendrik, where are all the carpenters from? Yeah, Sharon introduced them all to to our forum. So yeah. Wow, Andre Retief. Uh, I'm from Clinton Park, in Gauteng. Yeah, Andre is, is, is yeah, Andre is one of the board members of Gumensa, so yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. But young know, Andre, your face looks very familiar with me. Uh, we've probably met sometime in my lifetime because I know your face. Possible. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that before. Okay, the other guys I can't see. Is there anybody from Bloemfontein, Andre? No, Johan is uh in Durban. Okay. And um, I don't know, Piet, where, where do you live? Uh, There's a Rikas as well. Like the, just put on his mic. Yeah, uh, Rikas. Um, um, Piet is Rikas. Or Rikas is not um, Piet, nie, so uh, yeah. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, yeah, I guess from Rodeport. Well, okay, there's someone from Rodeport. Wow. Yeah. They're from all over. Okay, Hendrik, is there any more questions? Are you guys done with me? Yeah, I think we can more or less wrap up. I don't know if you want to wrap up for us this morning, Sharon, because, uh, yeah, okay. please, if well, you don't I'm... mind. <laughs> okay, well, Andre, thank you very much. I think it was, yeah, very informative. Um, and I think, Dion, thank you for the suggestion. And please include all of us in that. I would love to hear more about what you do with your families and the family businesses and issues that you might have there i'm thinking about my own family business and how that's going to be a problem one day <laughs> so yeah, not that i have true. one yet but that's the plot so i think yeah. um yeah yeah thank you for your time and uh thank you everybody for showing up this morning and yeah hopefully we engage with you again somewhere down the road yeah. okay. it's only a pleasure guys i really enjoyed with you guys i understand your world and it's very nice you thank you for the opportunity Hendrik, as well work well,